There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all back to the inner verse. Thanks for tuning in and showing up for your own well-being today. I'm your host Chance and if you're like me, you may notice lots of little synchronicities building up in your life where you think about something and then it happens or you're in a conversation and what the other person's about to say keeps popping into your head. Or maybe you have little flashes of insight like mental movies that sometimes predict the future, but other times seem random and inexplicable. And then finally, one I've been having a lot lately is seeing the room around me in my mind pretty clearly when my eyes are closed. If you're nodding in agreement and can relate to any of these odd and sometimes awe-inspiring experiences, chances are you're awakening to your latent psychic abilities. But how many of us have explored enough of our internal architecture to really master these gifts and use them for good? Providing positive perspectives about the power of your inner infinity is what this podcast is all about. And so I'm pumped to present today's guest, the professor of precognition and master of mind-to-mind mentoring, the psychic medium and healer known as Cody Edner. As a professional clairvoyant, co-host of the Energy Matters podcast, and metaphysical course creator, Cody has racked up over 30 years of experience in an area of consciousness that at least half of humanity has yet to even acknowledge as real. But the proof is in the pudding, as they say, and Cody's countless clients throughout an impressive 30-year career speak to the efficacy of his efforts. He seems to know just where to look within to grab profound nuggets of gnosis through magical mental osmosis with others. Check out Cody's classes at intuitivevision.net, more courses at energymattersacademy.com, and the Energy Matters podcast with his co-host David Gandelman. And of course, there's links to all that and more in the show notes for this episode. And don't forget about Interverse Plus, the extended version of this show with a bonus second hour each week available at patreon.com forward slash Interverse for the very affordable rate of $5 a month. Support your favorite show and get more of it at the same time and connect with us in the Interverse podcast Facebook group too if you want to meet more like-minded artists and seekers in our community. So let's get this party started and pass the mic to our first time guest here today, the compassionate clairvoyant and connector to cosmic consciousness, Cody Edner. Cody, my man, thanks for being here and welcome to the Interverse. Hey, Chance. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I love that. Uh, what would you say? Um, professor of, of uh, precognition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I've never been introduced that way. I've been called a lot of things, but I don't know if I've been called that. <laughs> cool. Cool. Well, then I did my job. I like to be, have some fun with those intros. For yes, sure. I love it. I love it. But checking out you has been pretty inspiring. I've listened to you on some other shows, listened to your show, and uh, checked out all the stuff on your websites. And I was hoping you could tell us your personal superhero origin story and what you've been up to since you activated your superpowers. Yeah, that's a good place to start. That's actually in our show, uh, Energy Matters. We we like to interview people about that same type of thing, the awakening and the opening, because, you know, it happens for everybody, but not everybody gets a chance to follow it and uh, to kind of stop and pursue that, that path. And for me, it, you know, it's, it's not like it's a one-time thing, right? We have uh, multiple signs that will start to appear in our lives. And if we stop and, and have the space to heed those signs and start to ask the right questions, you know, we get to some, some pretty interesting answers. And the the one opening that stands out to me the most when I was younger, uh, I was about 14, and that was the first time I went to see a psychic. And prior to that, I'd been interested in uh, this universe of energy and awareness and mediumship and, and kind of the things of the day. You know, this was back uh, probably in the early 80s. <laughs> so um, got a, a few years on you there, Chance. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, I wasn't around yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I went to the this, this psychic and and I didn't go alone. I was actually, I was, uh, I had that, my crazy aunt. I don't know, everybody's probably got the crazy aunt, right? That that opens the doors for us in our youth. And uh, she was taking me out 
to lunch and just shopping for the day for my birthday. I'm like, it was 14th birthday. And uh, we happened to go to a bookstore and, and above the, the bookstore, there was uh, a psychic, a, a palm reader. And she said, do you want to get a reading? And I said, sure, I would love to try that. And so we, we go up and see this palm reader. And, and when we get into the reading, uh, by it, I kind of realize now she really wanted a reading because she went first. She said, well, I want to go first. I want to get a reading. And so I got to sit in on her reading. And there's this thing about being exposed to psychic energy uh, that I didn't know at the time, but I know now as a teacher, that one of the ways we teach someone is we have them uh, sit alongside of and match someone who's already opened up. And the minute you kind of connect with that other person's energy, you start to open up too. And so I'm sitting in this reading and my aunt's asking these questions. And for every question, I, in my head, I was answering it before the psychic said anything. And I was having the same answers. And that was the first time I kind of realized, and the thought at the time was, oh, I can do this. This makes sense to me. This is easy. And my experience in the world before that was that I didn't really know where I fit in. And I didn't really connect with some of the, the kind of ways that people interacted and the uh, games that people played. In fact, I felt kind of disconnected from the world in a lot of ways. And, and I had these experiences before that of seeing energy. I would tend to see things around people, but I didn't know how to interpret them. And so I would see auras or, and I would see uh, a lot of times like a distortion field around a person might be a way to describe it. Uh, rarely colors, but sometimes colors. And I didn't have a really good way to relate to that and to um, interact with that in the world. But the minute I kind of had this experience with the psychic where I was reading along with her, I, everything kind of made sense to me. Like, oh, I can do this. This makes sense in the world. This is how I see things. It kind of became a bit of a, just a, maybe a, a almost subconscious realization. I mean, I didn't have a way to articulate it at the time. It's just everything made sense. And then I got my reading and, uh, and I don't really remember much from the reading, but I actually, back then we had cassette tapes. You know, we recorded our readings on cassette tapes. So I, I found my cassette tape like a decade later and, and I listened to it. And when she got, came to the point of, uh, do you have any questions? I only had one question, which as a 14-year-old struck me as, as kind of a funny question. But it was to ask her, how do I develop my psychic abilities? And that was my thing then. And luckily, about four years later, I stumbled into a place uh, called the Berkeley Psychic Institute where I got my first uh, reading in a place that also taught you how to develop your psychic abilities. And, and that was a very big experience as well. Uh, sitting in front of someone, I got a reading and, and he did, you know, the talking was all wonderful, but the thing that stood out to me um, in that reading was at the end, he said, do you want a healing? And I said, sure. And he, he kind of put his hand in front of himself and started to, to work with the energy. And the minute he did that, I felt a rush of energy and saw a flash of colors in a way that I'd never, uh, never experienced. And in that moment, I knew I had to learn how to do that. And, and then I kind of started to pursue it then. I think I was probably 17 at the time. So it was maybe three, four years after I'd gotten my first reading that I found the answer to that question of how do you develop your abilities? Because it's not really a question that someone can answer, you know, in a reading in three sentences. It's a path, right? It's a place. I was going to say, did she have good advice? What, no, she answer? really didn't have a good answer. And, and that was the other thing that I learned about that was that, there's a lot of really talented, she was a wonderful reader, really talented psychics out there who, for her, it was a gift. It just turned on and she found her own way with it. So she didn't really know how to teach it to someone else. She really didn't know how she did what she did, right? She just did it. Um, and there's a big difference between someone that uh, just does it 
and someone that kind of knows how you do what you do. Uh, that might be the difference between a, a star player and a coach, right? A coach can teach someone how to do it. The player just kind of, it comes out of them and they may, may or may not know how they do what they do. Um, so, so finding that school was where I found a place that had a structure and a method and tools. Essentially, it was all about the tools to be able to, to kind of shift your energy into this different uh, level of perception, different level of awareness. Um, and it started with meditation at that point. You know, it's like you have to learn uh, how to go inward to open that door, or how to pay attention to, to a different level of perception, uh, to open that door to reading. And then a lot of it then is practice. How do you interpret what you're starting to see? How do you make sense of it? I think a lot of people, when they start to open up, I don't think their problem is that they don't have enough information. I think a lot of times our problem is we're um, kind of overwhelmed with too much information coming in. How do you sort it out and make sense of it and put it in its place and time and, and you know, its context? Yeah, that kind of relates to a question. I A question I had was like, do you see different ways that psychic ability manifests in people? Like some people get impressions, some people maybe feel something in their body or maybe Absolutely. Every, does everybody have all of the spectrum, but certain ones are like their strong suit. Kind of, what, are the, yeah. what is the range I guess that you've experienced or seen is my question. Right. And, and a lot of that range Depends on where you're looking from, we, we could say in some way. So, so yes, the underlying idea is that everybody's psychic. Um, everybody has within them the ability to not only see energy in some form or perceive it, let's say, in some form, but uh, to manipulate it, to, to be a healer as well, um, to varying degrees. You know, and we each have our, maybe our own talent and our own proclivity of what kind of who we are that we bring to the table, but we all have that ability innately within us to be psychic. So the most common sense of, of a psychic connection you might have with someone is, is at what we would consider the second chakra level, which would be the empathic, uh, clairsentient uh, level of connection. So clairsentience is a bil an ability to feel what other people are, are feeling or feel their emotions and and you can read uh that way and most of us do you walk into a room and if you kind of get a sense of the feeling in the room you're using that clairsentience so much of that ability is innately used in us in a sense of is it safe or not right is this a safe place or a place i could feel comfortable in do i need to have my guard up uh, should I just leave or not go there? Uh, a lot of times we listen to that part of ourselves and it might keep us out of a bit of trouble. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but there's a there's a downside to it when you're not understanding or understanding what the feeling is, at least in my experience. I used to have a really extreme tendency to take on other people's bad feelings about themselves and not realize that it wasn't coming yes. from me. And uh that was like before I realized even that I was empathic or even what that meant, had any clue what that was. That was a bit of a struggle for me. And now. Absolutely. Now I still notice it happen and it's equally as like intense sometimes. But uh, I just will like whip out a grounding stone or something like that and and do something about it. But I just wanted to point that out that we can our abilities can sabotage us if we are clo close to them or don't understand them a little bit. Right. There is that. There's a couple of problems with that ability. And I certainly don't teach people to read someone through that ability. I'm just kind of answering your question of, uh, you know, what is the scope of, of our abilities and, and how is it that we might be uh, psychic and not know it? And this is the most common one where uh, we can be very sensitive and very psychic at through that clairsentient ability and not uh, realize it. And not only do we take on their ability, energies, which is, uh, you know, absorbing energy, you're left with it. But you may go into a space and if you don't realize that what you're feeling isn't you, a feeling is a feeling. So you can just feel it as if it's you. And someone who's 
turned on in this way can go into a place and take on everyone's pain, let's say, and suddenly you're simply in pain. You don't realize that that's not you. Or you might take on everybody's insecurity and suddenly you feel really extremely insecure and you don't realize that, you know, no, everybody's not judging me or they aren't thinking bad things about me. I'm just feeling their insecurity as if it's mine. Um, and so you could be a very confident, secure person in many ways. But if you don't have a handle on this part of you and you go into a place where you get in contact with someone that's, say, really insecure, you might suddenly feel insecure, angry or whatever it is. Well, what's tricky about it is it's like magnifying. It, it magnifies the insecurity you actually innately naturally have. We all have a little bit sure. of insecurity. So when the feeling comes in, your brain like goes, okay, well, why is this feeling present? It must be from this. And it'll just whip out some right. old pattern of thinking that was self-defeating and be like, this is why you feel this way. <laughs> and exactly. so then you really did think it came from you. So it's it's tricky because it comes from you a little bit. It resonates with what's already inside you. And so you have to have that self-work, self-awareness thing present, I guess, to uh, to mitigate that. Yes. And so that's where I'm starting to know we kind of teach it in terms of, or I, my and David, uh, we teach it in terms of knowing your own space, right? Know, knowing what your own energy is. So you can have a match with someone, which is that similarity. And when you come in contact with them, if you don't realize that uh, it's not you and you take their energy on, it magnifies uh, and, and multiplies, yes, exactly what you're feeling. So then you're stuck with it, you know, at that point. Like once you feel it, you've felt it. And you're right. A lot of what happens is if you don't have an answer for why you're feeling that, then your brain uh, kind of has to answer that question. And it will answer it by uh, kind of going to, you know, your fears oftentimes or your pattern, you know, your programming type of a thing. Yeah, because for the brain, it's like survival because the brain's like, exactly. okay, why do you feel anxious? Is there a tiger? Are you about to drown? Like, it's just trying to figure it out because it's trying to keep you safe in a way. Right. It has to answer that question. And very much that when we're talking about the second chakra, that is a part of your survival uh, mechanism in the world. So, uh, so are you, know, you talking like sacral second chakra? Uh, just a couple fingers below the navel. So the okay. first chakra is at the, the base of the spine. And then usually around the navel or a couple of fingers below is, is the second chakra. So, I mean, the chakras in the system I'm talking about, there's seven of them and they start at the base of the spine. Cool. So they're numbered arbitrarily, just one up to seven. So kind of based on like the Hindu chakra system, general, generally speaking. Yeah, and it seems to be a fairly common... Uh, chakra system in the U.S. Uh, spirituality and, and meditation. Um, it, it seems to be the one that has really kind of was in all the books, you know, back in the 70s and 60s. And It's nice that we have this new collective understanding that is sort of a shared definition of terms that, especially in the last like decade, I've seen so many more people that will know what that is and can right. talk to you about it before that. I mean, like when I was in high school, that word might as well have been something completely foreign, like uh, com another language. I mean, yeah. I guess it is another language, but <laughs> yeah, it's become an English word though. <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Yeah. That, and it definitely has. And it's become a word that uh, everybody knows, you know, at least in a pop culture way, they, they know the word chakra and they've, mostly heard it, I think most people, and maybe a lot of people don't understand what it means or they kind of roll their eyes if you start talking about chakras, but it's it's there. It's kind of like grounding is there. When I started uh, working with energy and, and in getting into this world, uh, when I started teaching even, you know, I'd have a class come in and I'd ask if any, who'd, how many people had heard of grounding, let's say, and nobody had. And now you have a group of seekers come in to learn some energy tools and, and learn to tap into their psychic awareness. You say, how many people have heard of grounding or grounded before? And, you know, 80% of the, the room has. So it's, it has really shifted over the last 30 some odd years where a lot of these terms and ideas 
uh, that we work with in terms of energy and spirituality are also kind of in our culture and our language, whether it's the idea of space and personal space, uh, which was not a real big consideration, you know, in the early 80s when I started. And now everybody has a conceptualization of what that is and uh, boundaries and, um, and grounding being one of those things. You might even hear it, you know, a, a sportscaster might say, well, they, they looked very grounded in that mm. move, you know? Yeah. They might not mean it in a fully understood spiritual sense of what right. is really being said, but the it's creeping into even pop culture. Like you're saying, that's something I want to return to because grounding is a great topic and important thing to remind people of. I've brought it up on the show before that whenever I got into what opened up to energy and started even playing around with like energy healing, energy manipulation, crystals, didn't really know the importance of grounding and made myself sick of, yes. uh, over time until uh, someone taught me that. And then, wow, completely life changing. But my, my question uh, to follow up on what we got here on is since we're talking about chakras and this sort of common chakra conception system, are the other ways of perceiving psychically speaking related to other chakras connected to that? Right. And so that's where I kind of started was that uh, when you, when you were talking about different uh, types of say psychic ability, a lot of it has to do with where we're looking from. So if we're very much tuned into the information from our second chakra, that's that empathic type of a, a, a connection and opening for sentience. You know, the, the, the one that maybe is out there in terms of someone reading energy and seeing it would be clairvoyance, right? And, and that's the sixth chakra opening up and looking from the sixth chakra. So when we're centered in our sixth chakra accessing that, it, it becomes a very visual uh, world. That's where we would see energy and perceive things in that way. Um, you know, if you think of someone that's maybe being a bit more of a medium, there's like a, the idea of a direct voice medium. Uh, that's like a fifth chakra uh, ability. And, and we have the idea, say, of uh, knowingness, knowing something off the top of your head, just knowing an answer. That's in the crown chakra ability. And of course, it's a system, so they all work together and interact. But, you know, as, if I'm going to read someone's energy, I tend to center in the sixth chakra and look at the energy rather than feel it. Um, partly, if you feel it, if you open up and read in that way, it's, it's tiring. Yeah, you're like letting it in a little more. Yeah. And it takes longer to clear it after. So you can't uh, really interact with that many people that way without getting exhausted or, or having echoes of the last reading taint the next one type of a thing. Um, so if you're seeing it, it's a much cleaner uh, moment. It's kind of a much cleaner thing in the moment and it's a cleaner thing to separate from afterwards. So that's what our focus tends to be is how to see energy uh, in our classes. So, so we would teach someone first how to get it you know, open and connected with their own energy, how to control their energy, uh, but ultimately how to, how to see it, how to see energy. But everybody is psychic, I would say. That, that's the thing that the, the primary message is it's not a special gift, but it's innate in being because you are a spiritual being, which is made of energy that's, you know, having an experience in a body. So your true nature is uh, the energy self. So obviously you can start to tune into and perceive that self. Um, of course, the, the louder thing is the physical sensation world. Uh, that's the thing that crowds everything out. But, uh, you know, moving into that place where you start to perceive the subtler body and the subtle energy it, it just takes some meditation, some practice tools, uh, but it's not, uh, it's there for everybody, let's say. Yeah. That's cool. That's, I think uh, one of the most useful elements of my life was learning meditation and things just started changing and opening up and perspectives kept evolving from there. It got me out of the feeling of stuckness and uh, yeah, life 
definitely <laughs> is right. be- better with this type of awareness cultivation and like yes. psychic abilities. You will probably agree in general, what it means to be psychic is to just be aware of what you're sensing on all levels and not distracted you know, from your actual sensing. So it's, it's almost as in, it's almost literally as simple as like, well, I knew this because I could see it. Like <laughs> that's what people that are kind of closed off to that don't understand that it, it, right. it is that um, it can be that sharp of a sensory apparatus. And sometimes it just comes out for, I think everybody has this um, with people they're close with where you'll blurt out the same exact word or like me and my partner will start singing a song at the same time out of the blue that was in both of our heads at right. the same part of the song at the same moment. We'll just bust it out. Or here's another one that was really weird. A couple of weeks ago, we were in separate rooms and neither of us had been sneezing and we hadn't been talking or anything. And at the same time, out of nowhere, we both just let out a perfectly synchronized sneeze from across the building from each other where we could hear each other do it. It's really funny. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, we get in sync and in tune with each other like that. Um, you know, people that especially that we're close to, and uh, it's very interesting and fun things can happen. And I think the practicing psychic, we're practicing it as a skill, is learning how to get in sync with someone for, you know, a, a bit of time. So, say you're going to read them for an hour or whatever, you have to get in sync with their energy in the, a similar way uh, for that hour. And, and then you just give the feedback of the information that starts to come to you. Um, but, but we do that naturally with people that we're around, that we're close to, we'll, we'll line up to them. And, and, you know, the word psychic in many ways, the, the, the root of it, it is means soul essence. And so kind of exploring the psychic world is about getting connected with, uh, that essence of the soul or the energy self and and noticing the perceptions and the awarenesses that arise from there and starting to focus on that and, and in many ways let that guide your path and let that information inform your next step rather than your conditioning or programming. So it, it, that's kind of the shift of living, say, we have a lot of words for it now, whether we call it living a psychic life or an enlightened life or an aware, uh, awakened life. Um, you know, that it's about being connected with that part of yourself and letting the information that comes from that uh, inform your path forward. And that's where we start to create change. If, if our conditioning and programming informs our path forward, we just repeat the same thing over and over. That's all that that can bring us is the same pattern. Uh, so the minute you start to really shift your energy and and let that new information kind of guide you, that's when life becomes something different and something a little more excited. And like you say, that feeling of stuckness might go away. And for me, it was the world started to make more sense when I brought that awareness into it. Otherwise, it didn't make sense to me why people did what they did or why we structure it this way or why the game we the games we play that none of them make sense to me from a non or at least they didn't until i kind of woke up to the the psychic way of seeing things then everything kind of fell into place uh in a in a much bigger way so uh, that was the shift for me jives with me too uh whenever i got out of the sort of non-spiritual box I'd put myself in after I had rejected the original like religious right thing that was presented to me because, you know, that didn't feel right. Uh, that closed me off entirely. A lot of people probably can relate to that, but opening back up to the soul essence of things that I like looking at psychic as that definition, which is, uh, you know, that's great. Etymology always gives us a big clue as to the real deeper meaning of things. And yeah, with with that deeper meaning, I like to take it to heart, I guess, that the psychic level, the soul level is actually going. If you go all the way to the deepest part, it's just nature that you're touching, which is like this mind that's the totality of all mind in it's the one highest of all higher selves in a sense. So any multiple people, any two people that are 
actually able to feel inward to that deepest core of the nature mind or like the the god self the over mind the over soul whatever you want to call it you're able to have psychic information pass from one person to the other without going through the material medium because it's the same mind that's coordinating both of those separate minds whenever you get to the deep part at least that's kind of like a theory that i i like to present on how this even would work yeah and you know when we get to those levels we don't have a lot of good language for how to express that uh, you know one of the things about stepping into the psychic uh, world is it's more experiential. Like we can talk about it, but we like to guide you into to the experience of it, right? In a class or whatever, because that's where it makes sense. Like you suddenly have the firsthand experience of energy or of seeing, you know, where someone else's energy is or seeing that type of connection. And it becomes uh, very real all of a sudden. And and like you say, when you go into the that deeper level of connection with the energy of the universe uh, or the mind, might, we might think of it as that there is an underlying intelligence that organizes everything, and we're a part of that intelligence. And once you tap into that, uh, then you you have this ability to uh, share information and and pick up and, and then maybe interpret the information that is there in that energy connection that's really always there between us. Uh, usually it's in this place of us that where we're kind of unconscious to it. And I think in some ways, the deeper you go inward into awakening to the, the psychic information that's there, it, it's the, the deeper you're going into kind of the background information that was already always there in, in the background. And a lot of times people react to it, but haven't consciously been aware of it. So they'll react with each other to, to the energy that they're perceiving, but they couldn't articulate it. And when you start to tap into that information, you can start to articulate what's happening, which is where it starts to make sense of then like why people act the way they do makes a lot more sense because you're seeing what they're reacting to that they don't see. Um, so that's, that's one aspect of it. But yeah, there is this really unified, I don't know what to call it. It's like there's unified field theory. <laughs> there's, there's like the idea in um, quantum physics that makes a lot of sense to some of how the psychic stuff works, like entanglement and, and you know, those kinds of things uh, really speak to how energy works um, and how we're energy. And ultimately, I think that's to, to kind of start to step into the experience a little bit. We ultimately have to get the idea that not only everything is energy, but that your energy and that that's, that is your true kind of core makeup. And when you can start to get in touch with, see the world from that perspective, there's a whole different world that you start to see. I think it ex helps us understand the unconscious behavior mechanisms of crowds acting in unison too. Cause you know, yes. there's also this weird other end of the spectrum uh, from the highly psychic and attuned individual, which would be like the mass hysterical crowd, mass hysteria of a crowd where people are just like all doing the same crazy thing together just because everyone else is doing it. And yeah, it's because they're like feeling this same energy reservoir that the whole environment is saturated with, but they're not uh, interpreting it and choosing their perspective about it, I guess, or right. making in integrating it healthily or, or whatever. But one way to make sure that you are healthily maintaining your individuality against the potential energy of outside forces is getting grounded. And I want to make sure that we definitely give some space to this as a topic, because I'm sure you have a lot to say about energy hygiene. I've heard you talk about it to an extent already. And I think if there's one take home lesson from this episode that is really important for anybody, it would definitely be this concept of grounding. So what can you tell us about that? Yeah, let me come in on the crowd thing because that's oh, a sure. that's a really good point. Um, th and there's a couple of things at work in that kind of a dynamic. So one is that when a certain energy gets kind of set, we tend to match it. 
So we tend to uh, match our energy to the group, let's say. And we, and we can do this in a positive way. If you can go to you know, a party where everybody's excited and having fun, and if you match it, you're suddenly excited and having fun. And you can go to a party where it's kind of boring and nobody's having fun or just a few people are, and you might match uh, the part that's not having fun and you didn't have fun. Or you could go to the couple that are having fun and you match that and you would say you had fun. And those would be like the individuals, the ones. Well, or the little groups, let's say, but you say you match the little groups in any given setting. Um, And so when you match the energy, that's the feeling that happens. Now, a lot of times what is also happening, and this can happen in a group, is certain, I guess in the psychic world, we would say that a thought is a thing. So a thought is just, it's not just a thing you're having in your head alone oftentimes. It's a thing that you're starting to create as a reality that could be, say, out in the, the world. And, and so if a thought starts to happen in a group and it starts to gain energy, so say everybody's matched, well, suddenly the picture, let's say, that starts to go around in the group has a lot of force or energy put into it. And it, ha- it reached a certain point where it's kind of like a critical mass when that picture becomes the reality. And everybody will start to react to that or start to become it. And it'll start to manifest. And so there can be a positive group experience where there's a positive uplifting picture and everybody starts to be able to match it and, and react relative to it or interact with it and create that. And so we might consider that something that happens in a gathering like a church or or meditation group where suddenly everybody has an awakening and the power of the group leads us to a higher level of awareness, maybe a little bit higher than I could achieve on my own. So, you know, a, a meditation group can be a very powerful thing to help someone move beyond themselves. And it works in the opposite, you know, a group that is together. And in, you know, there's ideas like mass hysteria or maybe there's angry and upset, you know, suddenly the group starts to build that vibration and build a picture about what we're all going to do about it. And the group acts in unison uh, in that kind of picture and it can be destructive as well. So uh, it it works on both sides of the fence, though. Have you ever heard of the dancing plagues that happen in like the 14 to 1600s? No. No, no. Oh man, this is a funny thing to look up on like Wikipedia. Uh, apparently there throughout Europe in like that a- that aired era like 1400s through 1600s there would be occasional outbreaks of mass dancing in the street where people would just all in huge groups all the peasants would just dance until they collapsed from exhaustion for days on end. Sometimes people would dance till they had heart attacks and died. It was like a really intense phenomenon that happened a lot and wow uh it's i'm not sure exactly how to interpret it other than it is like an extreme pressure uh explosion breakthrough based from like extreme repression repression pressure similar thing build up of pressure from you know being in a feudal living state being right. maybe not so free not really free to dance that often who knows but these yeah. peasants would just like dance until they dropped man and it, that was like a t- another version of mass hysteria you could say yes where um maybe instead of the image being what they were collectively empowering together it was just like the feeling of antsiness or restlessness ants in my pants gotta dance i don't know but look that up on wikipedia it was really weird oh that's a trip never heard of that but yeah that would be a great example of of some form of like a mass hysteria or a mass movement um, that takes over someone and you know we're more subject to that when we're not very conscious of our own space and our own energy so we're just becoming whatever the strongest force around us is. The more you become grounded and, and kind of centered and conscious in your own space, the more you would have a, a relationship to that energy to where you have a choice then. So, so you could see what's happening before it even manifests and simply not match it. 
And then you might be the one in the crowd standing there going, what are these people are crazy? You know, what are they doing? Because you, you didn't match it. So it can, energy can sweep you away or we can get swept up in it and we can match it and become it. Or we can be conscious and aware and kind of self-aware enough that we don't become whatever's going on around us. We observe it. Unless we really want to. Well, yes, you still have a choice to participate, but the, the operative thing there is you have a choice. Yeah. Where those people didn't have a choice. It took them over. And, and that happens in a lot of settings. And there's a lot of stories about in, in a religious type setting, people, you know, spirit takes them over type of a thing. So there's a part of them that wants it and is seeking it, but there may not be a part of them aware that makes the choice in the moment, like that sees the two options, you know, it just, you kind of get moved into it. Um, and, and we have a lot of ritualized things to get us into spaces, certainly in our, in our world. I guess the worst manifestation of this, if we're looking at the whole spectrum, would be when like war and battlefields exactly. happen. That's Absolutely. where you go all the way to like the bottom. You're basically creating hell You're right. at that point. Exactly. And it can be uh, riots and different things like that. Any kind of a outbreak like that where you, you start to create destruction and, and uh, kind of hell, like you say, that would be be an example of uh, the the bad manifestation of it, I guess, if you want to call it that. I really love this. I didn't expect to go into like this crowd psychology thing, but I lo- I'm fascinated in it as a topic. So it's fun. <laughs> right. It's interesting as psychology. I think it's interesting to look at the everything through the lens of energy dynamics. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of has different levels to it, I'm sure. And, you know, some... Some of the, the crowd dynamics and psychology, maybe someone's leading it. Uh, the more interesting ones are where it's more spontaneous. Like there's not a leader of it, but somehow that picture goes around and gains enough strength that suddenly everybody starts to manifest it in their own way. But it seems like, you know, it's all the same type of thing. It's a trippy thing. To look at. Yeah, it is. It yeah. is. But yeah, let's uh, finally go ahead and answer like what we're going to tell people about grounding, you know, maybe like a little mini exercise they can bring into their daily lives or t- physical tools that you might recommend. Uh, and, you know, what do you think the energy dynamic is when we're grounding? Is it the earth that we are working with for that? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a definite... It, once you move into, let's say, the awareness that everything is energy, then this idea of grounding uh, it makes sense, right? Because grounding is kind of a, a thing that we associate with energy in in general. Like you have a you plug a cord into the wall, and the plug has one of the prongs is for grounding, right? It's so so that excess energy doesn't um, kind of leak out, let's say, or uh, affect whatever it is you're plugging in. I think my my the example I like for grounding is the idea of uh, a lightning rod. So once we get the idea that everything's energy and we're energy, and so you and I are each, say, a unit of energy or a universe of energy. Uh, so we could use this example of a lightning rod. So So you have a house. And if lightning strikes the house and there isn't a lightning rod and it comes into the house, you know, what happens? The, the, the energy of that um, lightning has to go somewhere and it bounces around the house until it finds places where it can be expressed or grounded, essentially, and it fries all the wires, it fries everything. Um, but if you have a grounding rod on the house, the lightning strikes, uh, the lightning rod, rather, it strikes the lightning rod and that, that energy is all channeled down into the ground and it's just rounded out. Um, so we're much like that. We're like an energy system that if uh, some charged energy comes our way and we're not grounded, it will tend to bounce around in us. And uh, we might experience that as agitation or frustration or anxiety or upset. And then if we're not grounded, we don't have anywhere to put it we'll have to pass it on to someone else. And so you might be agitated until you run into that person that the energy imbalance is right, that you can snap at them. And then they all of a sudden are in that energy. 
And but if you're grounded and the an energy comes your way, then you can release it and you don't feel the effect of it. You don't have to feel the effect of it. It doesn't bounce around in your universe. It doesn't carry on and build over time as agitation or frustration or what have you. So when you're grounded, uh, you have the opportunity to, one, be safe in your energy field. Uh, the other is to release or let go of energy as it arises um, because we're really sensitive to energy. And, and there's lots of people out there, uh, lots of us that we're so sensitive to energy that we have a hard time uh, going out in the world and feeling comfortable. Uh, but when you can really be grounded and have a sense of your own boundary, uh, it becomes a lot easier to go out into the world. It becomes safer uh, because that part of ourselves, uh, we, in a way, we've learned how to manage that part of ourselves through being grounded or we have a, a tool. Um, so to me, it's a very literal thing, being grounded. It's a, a thing that you connect yourself to the planet as the place you, you ground um, with a grounding cord, a line of energy that uh, you create. And, and in fact, uh, you specifically connect it to the first chakra. So you ground right from the root of your energy system all the way into the center of the planet. It's really the best place just because it's, it's kind of like a deep sense of connection. Um, so it's a very visual thing to be grounded. Um, but what that does is it allows you to then, uh, one, have your energy kind of around you a bit more. It makes it easier to be collected. So there's the sense when someone really gets grounded, they're suddenly more present and more collected. And it lets your energy be uh, kind of present itself in the world in, in a little bit stronger way. So you have to have a sense of a little bit more presence. Uh, when you're really grounded. Yeah, you won't be like pinging from thing to thing based on what's hitting you. Right. Which, yeah, that's a big deal. And I think one thing, I love how you describe the the psychic way of visualizing the grounding. As I did that, like just put a cord from my tailbone to the earth, I actually could feel an immediate connection. I could feel a, f a flow of energy from my tailbone right behind me and under me. But uh, what I would say is, that might be if it's, if you don't feel that or visualize it very well, just you because you use your imagination to imagine the feeling of it, imagine the visualizing of it. And then that gives your body and your mind a language to tell you how it does feel when you get grounded. So it's like just keep imagining it until you start to feel it without having to like fake it because you're not really faking it when you imagine it. That is the right. building of the connection is the imagining in a, in yeah. a sense. Well, and this this leads to kind of a misconception in the um, in our own say perception of the psychic world that can happen, which is we've been told if we see things in our mind's eye, we've been told that that's our imagination, and and it is it is how we can creatively imagine something that's beyond what's here, but that place where we imagine where we create an image and see an image is the same place that we would also interpret a psychic perception. So if I'm going to look at your aura and see the energy, I only have one place that I see stuff in. And sometimes I see a fantasy that I'm creating and sometimes I see uh, what I want to look at. And so it's all about learning to recognize what you're focusing on, what you're tuning into and what you're actually looking at. Because you, you know you, the imagination... It's the same apparatus in the same place. So whether I'm imagining, you know, a trip that I'm going on or I'm looking at your energy, I'm still kind of viewing it in the same way. Um, but I have to know what I'm doing with my energy and attention to know the difference between what's something I'm making up and what's something I'm creating or seeing. Um, so, you know, when I create a grounding cord, it is a visual thing. It is something that you see that image from the base of the spine into the planet in whatever image you want to use, whether you like a, a line of energy or, you know, a tree, if you're really into nature. So it's whatever. And, and it may be that as you start to see it, there's a feeling there 
or not, but you just start to, like you say, can kind of validate the, the visual first and the body will follow suit. Mm. And in many ways it is, it is a language. You, you are communicating something to your body as a spirit um, through that imagery. There is that mind body connection. And so a grounded, an image of being grounded translates to the body that it's safe, it's connected, it's here on the planet. Um, it, it has a lot of different layers to it. Yeah. Yeah. Physical and metaphysical. Right. Uh, one thing I like to consider with this imagination, perception, imagination being like, a, you know, it's one of your senses actually not just this faculty of creativity uh i like what idealists in philosophy have said before me which is that imagining isn't a type of thinking thinking is a type of imagining like imagining is the foundational thing and a lot of people have it backwards in their head about what is the primary thing but it's actually like that's the the nature mind the over mind whatever it's doing nothing but a big elaborate imagining (laughs) right yes and the way i would relate to that in in the psychic universe and, and the kind of the tools and perceptions that i offer is that there and i i kind of mentioned this word before this idea of a picture that's going around and so that is the imagining so So what's always first is a picture um, that that's how, let's say, how spirit communicates to the body. So I just offered a picture of a grounding cord and suddenly you, if you tried it out, you feel something happen in your body, but the picture's first. Um, That's actually how it happens is the picture's first, then we would have a feeling and a thought about that second. And it's always the picture's first. Um, but the perception is I felt something and then I had this thought. But the truth is, as a spirit, there was an imagining that happened, a picture. And then that kind of comes into us and we uh, relate to that through feeling and thought, which is secondary. So that's my perception is spirit moves everything else first, uh, not the other way around. But hmm. in the world, it seems like uh, matter moves everything first. Yeah, like your the matter affects your spirit when something happens, but actually, right. you internally changing is what's making the matter reflect it back to you. Right, and it does kind of go back and forth a little bit, but uh, there's a feedback loop. Yes, but spirit is, is yeah, spirit seems like the 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 core of it all for sure. Right. I guess one thing I wanted to make sure that you had a chance to do. I wanted to give you a little space to tell us anything else about the courses you offer at the Energy Matters Academy. Of course, talk about your podcast. We barely described that. And, you know, we just kind of went straight into the the nitty gritty stuff. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. You know, you do a lot of things. So I want to make sure that you are able to, as well-rounded a way as you like, get everyone up to speed on all the ways they can connect with you, learn from you. And uh, that'll be in the free section. Also, I will splice that back. Well, and certainly one one place to start is the energy matters podcast so so a few years ago um i kind of had this idea for for a podcast uh, talking just exploring these kinds of topics um exploring it maybe a little bit from the sense of uh people that are in the the wellness field and uh, awareness field and meditation type field um just their experience of how and their awareness of how uh, energy plays into what we do and how energy affects us. And, and that idea that energy matters is kind of an idea that uh, a lot of times we don't uh, recognize in, in the world out there that energy and that movement of spirit matters in, in what happens in the world. Uh, so much of the world is focused on materialism and, and you know, the physical side of things. So, so our idea is to explore the energy side of things. And we talk to all kinds of different people. And, and so our format is similar to this, except for there's uh, two of us, David uh, Gandelman and I uh, paired up to, to bring people on and interview them. And usually we interview one person. Sometimes we do podcasts uh, where it's just the two of us talking about a topic or something. Uh, so that's definitely something to explore. And then out of that, 
we have the Energy Matters Academy where we uh, teach uh, the beginnings of opening up to energy awareness and to your intuition and to how to read and look at and read energy. Um, we also have a, a course, a chakra exploration course, uh, intuitive chakra awareness course on daily ohm, uh, which you can access through our site. Um, so that's a, a couple of things that we have in terms of our courses through Energy Matters. And then my, my courses, where, where my focus is outside of that in intuitive vision, uh, is a little bit more uh, like postgraduate stuff. So if a person does their uh, cor- our other courses in intuitive development and learns to read energy and has uh, kind of worked that system for a while, uh, then then they can step into this arena of, of trans mediumship and, and exploring that side of themselves. Uh, although I am looking at an idea of um, uh, starting a mediumship course that's kind of for the non-trans medium, but just how to explore our, our mediumship in the world and how to relate to guides and entities uh, through that lens a little bit that would be a little bit more of a, a beginner course, but I haven't figured, figured that one out yet. And it would be a little bit shorter than my trans medium course. I don't know if you noticed, but the trans mediums that I train, uh, it's not a casual training. It's a five year training. So yeah, by I the end, that. by the end, they, you know, we're, they basically have their, their black belt or their graduate, their, their, <laughs> Their uh, doctorate degree in mediumship. No, they're pretty high level practitioners. And, but that's our goal. But we start everything with meditating. How do you learn how to, to ground and get centered and start to tap into this part of oneself? And, and it becomes a lifelong practice, actually. I mean, five years sounds like a long time, but we're talking about people that this has become their practice in their lives daily, right? They, they meditate and they work energy and, and they uh, use it as a, an approach to, to life and to growth. So you're telling me that you can't sell me an easy one press button for instant enlightenment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> if someone tries to sell you that, you know, <laughs> yeah, run away, <laughs> run away because it's, it is really about uh, developing something in ourselves that we want to grow in throughout our whole lives it's, it's yeah. like an art you know it's you, know, you think of uh, like martial arts is, is a great example of something that someone can practice throughout their whole life and grow in or tai chi or qigong uh anything that we kind of look at as an art doesn't really have an end point because we we're growing in that hopefully our whole lives and i consider uh, the mystical realm the psychic awareness um, as an as an art, and it's really for those of us that are kind of you know when we start to hear about energy and we start to see these concepts and we go, "Wow, now the world makes a little bit more sense to me for for those of us that are like that, when you start to step into uh, being able to see and read energy and and do what we're talking about, um, that is perhaps one of the ways you creatively express yourself, that is you being, you know, creative and being the creator. So for me, a reading, uh, when I come out of that, I might feel just as creatively satisfied as someone who painted a painting, if they're a painter, or who wrote a poem, if they're a poet. Uh, So for those of us that are really innately kind of tapped into this or came in with this, expressing it and learning how to kind of live in it and express it might be that place where you start to really satisfy a part of that creative sense of self. And, and then you grow in that. And, and so there's a fair amount of our creative energy that could be suppressed if we've had to suppress our psychic abilities. That That's great. To come back. I would have, I would love to even talk about that in more depth someday because that I, agree that's uh it is a creative act to i mean you're pulling something 
through the ether, just the way that a painter has a vision and puts it on canvas. Right. You're just translating it into words and expression, which definitely is an art form too, because you need to know how to communicate the idea. You have Absolutely. to have all this like intellectual scaffolding of the metaphors and the way you're analyzing it. And your left brain and right brain really have to be in sync, just like any other form of creativity. So that's totally. great. That's yeah. great. Well, yeah. uh, I guess that, we can wrap it up. I really appreciate you sticking around for the two hours. It was for me flew by because uh, I'm fascinated by all this. And right. you, you've been a great guest, man. It's been an honor to host you. And I would definitely love to talk again. And thank you so much for the time and everybody oh. go check out your website. Yeah. For sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me for sure. And I didn't even look, I mean, the two hours did just fly by. I didn't even realize, but that's what happens to me when I talk about this stuff. And it, it sounds like to you, you know, those of us that this is our thing, it's like time just just flies by when uh, when we get into this energy and into this uh, space. And and that's certainly something that happens in reading or mediumship is you lose track of time when you get into this space. Time has no uh, no real meaning. So, which is very liberating, kind of, very yes. liberating type of feeling too. So cool, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was great uh, being here and. Uh, Look forward to, to chatting again sometime. Awesome. Thanks, Cody. All right. Thank you, Chance. Well, my friends, we seem to have made it here once again to the end of another epic conversation. Big thanks to Cody Edner for coming on the show. I really love talking about metaphysical stuff and psychic abilities and human superpowers. I hope you guys enjoy this type of talk too, and maybe we've even pointed you in the direction of some resources you can go to develop your own abilities, which is probably the real reason why the podcast even exists here, is to try and point you in that direction, help you see what you might not have realized was possible for you, and yeah... Cody may be one of those people that kind of just snapped out of it and was all of a sudden able to access deeper levels of his abilities and powers as a, you know, conscious, infinite, super creator, mega being that we all are. But another person's raw talent will never equate to your hard work and dedication. So even if you didn't have the gift or whatever and you wanted to practice this type of stuff, you definitely can. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that pretty much all of us do have the ability. It's just a matter of what's blocking us from it. And yeah, like anything, there are aptitudes. There are things that we're more excited about doing than other people are. And that excitement is a big part of what actually fuels your aptitude. So if you want it, get stoked about it and then dive into the research and commit yourself to the practices. I mean, that would be more than I can say I've done. <laughs> I have some natural abilities like anybody kind of does, but I haven't spent a lot of time trying to specifically develop and practice psychic powers. You might be wondering why I didn't actually try to put Cody on the spot during the episode and make him like guess what number I was thinking or things like that. <laughs> I didn't even really think about it till after the show, but maybe that would have been more entertaining to stump the psychic or test the psychic and demonstrate his amazing abilities. I don't know. That just didn't really feel like fun to me. So I did what was fun for me, which is to get deep into the metaphysical mechanics and the ways that each of us can actually experience this differently in our own lives. And I think this conversation really paired nicely with the most recent episode with Lisa Erickson. She and I had an awesome conversation about trauma, about chakra empowerment, and some specific stuff about women's energy bodies. But while this conversation with Cody was more geared towards men or women, they do kind of go together nicely. There are some common themes between the two. And I love when that happens. It's never planned when episodes in the same month have a common ground or a common theme. It's just a cool little synchronicity from, I guess, the universe. Like I said, I did have a lot of fun with this one. It's always a blast for me to get to tell somebody about the dancing plagues. <laughs> if that's something you've never heard of, do go and look that up because it's wild, man. It seems to have really happened. I mean, with anything 
far back in history who can really say what happened or why, but there's more than one report. It seemed to have spread around the European area at different times. And yeah, I mean, on a sort of scientific level or psychological level, I can understand what would cause people to get that antsy that they'd have to dance. I mean, repression has been strong for centuries. And back then it was much stronger societal repression. So that was really fun to talk about. I really liked the conversation about knowing your own space and being able to discern my your energy from other people's or from the environment. And of course, talking about grounding methods is a very useful topic that anybody could benefit greatly from incorporating into their lifestyle, their daily practices, or at least as a response to something that you're going through that's ungrounding. And in the plus conversation, the second hour of the show that you can get by signing up at patreon.com forward slash interverse, we went deeper into pretty much everything that we cracked open in the first hour. We talked about how technology influences our energy body, not just our physical body. We got more into grounding practices and how they can help us navigate the psychic experience. The expanded consciousness view on dual and non-dual aspects of reality. So that got really good and philosophical. We discussed spiritual deprogramming as it works in the class that Cody teaches. And the difference between energy blocks in the body versus in the mind. Similarities between the creative flow state and mediumship. We talked about transmedium training that Cody provides and stepping out of the physical to access information. That's real juicy. And we had a conversation about hypnotic states and protecting oneself against malefic spirits or manipulative people. And of course, that's not everything that's in the plus extension, but I can only tell you about so much of it. The rest you're going to have to hear for yourself. Remember, if you sign up as a patron on Patreon for $5 a month, you're getting each and every podcast double length, exclusive, super long two hour conversations, which are much more fun because we get a lot deeper and weirder in the second hour. I mean, it's kind of inevitable that after you talk to someone for an hour, the second hour, you're further from the surface of what they're about and deeper into the core. I mean, it just seems logical. So if you like Interverse, if it might even be your favorite podcast, what are you waiting for, man? Do yourself a favor, buy yourself a Christmas present that's also a Christmas present for me, which is a $5 subscription. I mean, you can cancel any time. It's great. If you want to just hear certain episodes, I don't mind. I would just like a little support and I'd like more of you to hear the awesome plus extensions because like I said, I think they're better than the first hour and it pains me to paywall them, but I have to be real about my own personal boundaries with energy, which would be vastly in disarray if I didn't create some sort of way that you can reciprocate all the time and energy I put into the show back to me. And I don't put ads in here. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I barely do anything self-promotional, unfortunately. (laughs) It's kind of a flaw. So do it for me if you like me and you don't want to pay me. Do some sharing of the show. That'd be awesome. Let people know about it. Tell your family about this weird podcast you're into while you're uh, at your Christmas break, seeing all them, especially if they're totally not into off-the-wall stuff like we talk about. All the more reason to expose them to the expanded consciousness universe of strange phenomenon and creative capacities of human beings. I do like to think that while not every episode or guest might be for everyone, there is something interesting to pretty much anybody in the archives of the show. And then plus there are 70, maybe 80 at this point. I'm not exactly sure. It's easy to lose track. But that's probably how many episodes I've done with full on second hour plus extension. So getting a lot of bang for your buck for that $5 and it will help me keep doing this, get the equipment I need, feed myself sometimes. You never know what $5 means to another person. But for me, whenever I see one of you guys sign up, I get a big boost just out of the fact that someone is investing in more self-knowledge, more self-exploration, And of course, investing in my podcasting journey, which I really wouldn't be able to expand that journey without your investments, because there's only so much I can do. Because if I was all alone in this journey, it would really be just an audio journal of conversations I'm having with people. 
The real point is that it's going out to you and you're taking it in, absorbing it, maybe even connecting with the, the guest of the day, which with Cody, you definitely could stand to benefit quite a bit by connecting either through listening to his show too, or finding one of the courses he offers and jumping in to expand your powers, man. Uh, you have infinite power, but you have a limited mindset. So when you think about it, that's like the primary conflict of the entire universe, which is that infinite source consciousness decided to limit its perspective on what of itself it could see. And boom, voila, before too long, you've got a universe like we've got with all this duality and all this light and dark and all this knowing and not knowing and all this happy and sad. It is a fun game, though. I'm glad we're playing it. I'm glad we're both in the same dimension together. And I had to also mention to you before I hop off here that there is a really amazing video live podcast that I did with Jamie Seed. Jamie's been on the podcast a gang of times. Seems like every December he comes on and, and we do a little wrap up, talk about things he wants to get off his chest. Jamie's a really good friend of mine who is an epic photographer in the music festival world and an all around hype man and good guy. Very, very supportive of friends and has a large following. So he does a good job of blowing people up. And I really appreciate him coming on and doing a live stream with me that was a three hour super show. You can find the video of that on Facebook at the Interverse page, which is where the live stream happened. Or you can go to YouTube and type in Interverse if you're not subscribed there. And you'll find that three hour super show. We did call ins. So if it sounds like fun to you to call in like a live radio show type thing, let me know by leaving a comment on one of those videos and saying, do this again or or whatever. And maybe I'll do a better job of alerting the masses that is happening next time. It was kind of a spontaneous thing, but it felt like the right way to finish off 2019 podcasting season in style. And the live call-ins were amazing. They actually all turned out to be people who had been guests on the show before. So it became quite an entertaining and enlightening experience. And I will probably get around to posting the audio version of that conversation on the Interverse feed for the uh, podcast RSS feed at some point. So you'll see it there. But there were some video components that make it very much worth watching. And like I said, it was a super show, three hours long. I think a total of six or seven people, including myself, were involved in that conversation over the course of three hours. We talked about bad experiences with cops and how to <laughs> transmute those fear feelings. And when you're in, quote unquote, trouble, even for something you didn't do, uh, and how to just shine love and bring compassion to the situation and not get into worse trouble with cops. We talked about a lot of stuff that happened in 2019 that was kind of messed up or at least controversial and got a little riled up about some aspects. It was quite a powerful live energy that was happening in that broadcast. And we talked about, but it was a three hour show. So we talked about a lot of stuff and it would be silly for me to try to describe it all to you. Just know that it's out there on the Interverse YouTube and I've got another shorter video that I'm going to post on YouTube and Facebook soon, and I'll still put an audio version in our RSS feed, but I just wanted to let you know that there are occasionally alternate styles of content that I put out. I still am experimenting a little bit with video. It's, I mean, a lot of fun for me. It's just not as easy to clean up and make quite as nice as the uh, audio only shows are. So it's more work for me. All the more reason for you to support me on Patreon, because then I guarantee there would be more video content if I had more resources to throw at doing the show, including and especially time. So, yeah, uh, that's all I got for you guys for today. There will be probably two more episodes, full episodes, aside from the ones I was just describing in 2019 before the end, because I do have several recorded and in the shoot just waiting for me to get around to chopping them up and putting them out there. I love and appreciate you guys. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast and big thanks to everyone who supports on Patreon. You guys mean a lot. Like I said, every time I see one of you add a subscription, I feel way more validated about what I'm doing. I know I should just do what I know is right and not seek validation from <laughs> the world and from other people, but 
you have no idea how special it feels when you decide to become a plus member because it makes me feel like my dream of being a podcast host is real. Even though I'm doing it and been doing it for years, something about it feels almost like I'm faking it until I actually have people showing up to support it and, you know, engaging with me about it. So find me on social media, follow Interverse on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Hit me up. Send me a message. Let me know what you think of the show. Let me know who you want to have on the show. What direction you'd like to see the podcast go in the future. Can't promise that I'll do whatever you ask, but I would love the feedback because, you know, I'm still exploring myself. I mean, there's tons of directions I could see myself going with Interverse. So we're just getting started. 2020 is going to be killer. And I can't wait to keep it going. Keep learning and expanding and fueling that stoked passion for life and art and music and fun. And yeah, we got this. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.